All right, we are live. Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the Dark Task for the Renaissance Channel. Uh, Ego here. I'm calling me Namdi. Hello, and everyone. Hello, hello, everyone. We and we've got a, a special guest today, uh, who's joined us. Um, we've got Prince Justice Faloye. Um, oh, sorry, I'm hearing an echo. Yeah. Pardon me. Yeah, we've got Prince Justice Fawe, who is a social scientist, uh, author, uh, filmmaker, documentarian, um, and he's um, the author of the book uh, The Black World, Evolution to Revolution. He's, really, he's a proprietor of a, a channel on, um, on YouTube called AU Media, or All Media, and uh, he talks about... Um, the origins of, of the black race, of, of the black man, and has the very revolutionary theories as to our origins, um, migrations, um, and history. Uh, so uh, welcome, uh, Prince Justice, to the show. Uh, good to have you. Uh, good evening. Good it's evening. nice uh, being on your show. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. Oh, and we've just had a Baruti join us as well. Baruti, how are you? Oh, yes. Uh, just fine. How are you? And hello to our guest tonight. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, as, as I just introduced, this is uh, Prince Justice Faloye, um, author of the book, The Black World, Evolution to Revolution. Um, and we're just about to ask him a bit about himself. So, um, um, this is a social scientist. Could you just give us a little bit of background as to... Um, how you got into the work you get you got you're into now um back, background into yourself please um yeah i'm a social scientist i my first degree was in economics but um even that i'd, I'd always had the uh the ambition to write a complete volume you know covering um the black race from beginning to uh, I mean, to the end, and um, that came about from my childhood. Uh, growing up with white Jehovah Witness uh, parents, then moving down to Nigeria, then realizing that the Bible and everything we did talk about my own story. So there was this thing that I was going to put something, and um, my grandfather at the time used to task me on um, the Bible and about writing from an African perspective. So, you know, with the name, the family background and everything, I, I, did, I mean, I finally made up my mind to study economics and to understand um, the black race before I actually went to study economics. I didn't just go into an economics because, but at that early age, I knew where I was going and what I wanted to do. It took time. I initially wrote some books which were published, but I knew I could write, but, you know, eventually I got um, pen to paper while living in New York. And, uh, you know, um, brought up the Black World uh, to do about and um, the skills of the Vex Giants. So, I mean, I wrote all the books together around the same time. And um, we've gone on from there. We've had uh, new editions. And we've also put um, the things into practice, which is uh, where we are now with um, Asha Foundation. So thank you very much. Um, so uh, I think we'll jump straight into it. So uh, about your book, you make um, some very interesting uh, claims and insights. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll be very clear about it. You say the origin of civilization started from Nigeria. And you have reasons as to why you've, you've made those uh, claims or assertions. You've, in your uh, documentary on YouTube, 
30 minute, 30 minute documentary, which was seen by over 30,000 people. Um, you go to break down the, the, uh, the, the travel of the ge genealogy, um, different artifact archaeology, um, history, uh, going back to ancient Egypt and various migrations as well. So um, why, why do you say that the, the origin of man uh, came from where is modern day Nigeria? as opposed to what is the um, accepted um, norm that it came from, you know, the eastern, eastern part of Africa, which is around Kenya, Tanzania, uh, or, or that, that region? Yeah. I mean, I've always said, when I started out, I did not have any um, wish or inclination to, to focus it on Nigeria. It just happened to you know, with the information that I got while compiling, um, I actually sat down to write in 1998-99. And it was, it was a flight from, I mean, coming back from New York to London, and I saw this uh, clip, in the, you know, in the International Herald, talking about DNA. And that was the first time that um, I actually had the evidence even though um, through my schooling, as well as at the O levels, I always ask those questions that why or how? I mean, because I knew geography perfectly, you know, I had an A1 in my level. And I knew that the most fertile point in Africa was in West Africa. I knew the direction of the rain um the vegetation so i used to question that why would um the so-called garden of eden come from west africa and not east africa and you could also see that where you had the most um the most uh fertile region the lowland um, rainforest was i mean it was also where you had the largest population in africa it was the richest the most prosperous so there were so many things that pointed to it, but I wouldn't have made that, uh, I mean, at a couple of points, you understand where I was beginning to question. But now when I got the DNA, because at that time they were, I mean, they were still carrying out the Human Genome Project. So, you know, after reading it, I went online and I got into the site, the Human Genome Project, and then, you know, it was there that I saw, okay, that so far that you has had the oldest uh, DNA among full -fatured, um, um Africans. And there was a statement then that caught me that everything, um, you know, everything in the DNA of Europeans could be found in your DNA. So, you know, I kept on following them and um, accumulating uh evidence until i finally realized that okay this is it but well, what really worked was um around 2000 there was uh, this christian scientist backlash where they told them the then head that they could not um, bring out uh, the oldest dna and that to shake mainstream belief then apart from the 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 metrodrinal, um, DNA, there were so many other things. The cultural um, anthropologists, linguists, had said that all the land spread from the same spot, from southern Nigeria, and that we are a continuum of dialects. So we had all these things together. You understand, and my main um, objective was to write from the beginning to present day. So when I first released the first um, edition, because when um, Human Genome Genome Project uh, came out and they formed the International Half Map Project to put the evidence into use, they, they refused to release the um, the DNA, the raw DNA um, figures that you can see, 
um, on the screen. But the, they now use Yoruba as the base DNA in the International Heart Map Project. So I wrote to um, Charles, wrote to me and a few other, and a few other uh, black um, uh, participants, you know, some that want to form the Roots um, project. But like, why is this happening? Why are you refusing to release the identity yet using it? But um, was, I mean, it wasn't until 2009 that you now had the first writings from um, Sevatishkov and uh, Patton, uh, Patton, who um, now release those freedoms. Or well, still, Sevatishkov decided to um, play smart by including a group called the Lemandi, which does not exist into the uh, DNA and um, you know that's how uh, you know gradually we uh, were able to put everything together and then um, challenge them. Oh. It's interesting. Um, I, don't know, I, don't know, I don't know if one of you, sorry for do you want to do you want to say something or ask a question? Yes. Um, okay. Prince Faloye, I, I have a question for you. Yes. When I uh, when I first reviewed the the video that was was done uh, concerning the um, the origin of of humanity that you put out earlier before the show, I I, I noticed that it seemed to imply in in the video something to the effect of that the oldest uh, civilization was in what we now know as present Nigeria. Now, uh, unless I'm missing something, I I didn't get the impression that it necessarily uh, talked about from a genetic standpoint. So could you could you distinguish if, if possible between um, a human community and a civilization? Or are you saying that the oldest genetic uh, peoples come from the regions of what we now know as Nigeria. Well, there's the origin of humanity on one side and it's the origin of civilization. And when we talk about civilization, we're talking about advanced social organization. We're talking about uh, the people um, organizing and you know, storing and organizing the information systems. Now, when we look at it, um, when we talk about the evolution, I mean the evolutionary bit, you know, like I, you know, like I um, showed is that look, if you're going to have, you know, without DNA or anything, if in Africa you're going to have, um, I'm going to have I mean, what is the most conducive area for evolution? And then you also have, I see another thing about civilization, which I might use that. The European idea of civilization is that civilization started with agriculture. Now, this is not really correct because in southern Nigeria, you know, has, you know, after evolving, what people picked were wild yams. Now, there was this question of the wild yam question of uh, whether those in the forest would have um, had an organized feeding um, pattern without savanna agriculture. Well, this was proven that, look, the civilizations or um, the, the human group in the forest evolved picking the yam and eventually because, I mean, eventually developed a system around that uh, that uh, feeding pattern, which was young. You realize that the Yorubas and Igbos and all those in Southwest, all the festivals revolve around um, young. Now, when we talk about the full evidence of um, 
of uh, civilization. IFA, AFA, the 16 um, sector uh, information retrieval system, is um, the oldest uh, knowledge bank and religion. So, and you know, people have said that it was from the um, the binary uh, knowledge um, base that I mean, had all these other uh, knowledge systems evolved from the, the the science of the sand, you know, by the Arabs, the you know how it moved down to Hindu, and the Rigveda, which was later um, converted. I mean, later um, converted. So what? And you see, when you talk about civilization, we're not talking about only one tribe and what they did, but how the system of thinking of, of, of organization spread across a large number of people. You know, people Afa, the same 16, and how they organized it. So when we look at that, you can I see another thing is the culture, the, um, which, which is reflected in language. If you look at all um, full started Africans, you know, East Africa and South Africa, we know how we diverged, you know, across, you know, which that map I showed you, how we went up um, with the Benway into, um, you know, you know, Benway into Cameroon, down River Shanghai, you know, to Black River, into Kenya and the South Africa, I mean, you know, Ethiopia and later South Africa. Now, if you look at that cultural complex, they have uh, the same pattern, the same naturalist pattern, the laws of natural just, I mean, laws of institutional justice. The totem is mostly the male part, um, and they have the same ways of doing things. Which is rather different from um, Abrahamic civilizations or Asiatic civilization, even though the original African civilization is a bit closer to the Buddhist uh, civilization and organization. Because you see, because one of the things that uh, you realize is that man organizes himself as he organizes his pattern. I mean, his pattern of gods. And this is, you understand the Osha system, the IFA system is the basis of that civilization. Okay. Thank okay. you. I, 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 I have a question though. Um, I think yeah. my question, my question is based on uh, some of the writings in your book and the uh, and your documentary as well. Uh, I think you men you mentioned that. Uh, uh, again, correct me if I'm wrong. Now, um, just want to find out if are we are we still in the age? Are we still in the era of Shongo, Amadioha, or Baal? I think the, the Egyptians call the god of thunder Baal, uh, but uh, I think the Europeans know the, the god of thunder as Shongo, uh, and the Igbos call him Amadioha. So different different cultures have different names that they they used to ascribe or describe their, their gods of thunder. No. So I just want to understand from your perspective, if we are still in that era, or has that era elapsed? But, but, but before before we get to that, um, there's, there's a, the, um, moving from geneal genealogy and, and that, that scientific um, um, analysis, then your documentary in particular uh, starts to go into cos the cosmology, I guess the historical aspect of the cosmology of our people. Uh, and origins of our people. So could you just touch on that before I think it gets to the Nandi's um, question and how you tied in or where, uh, the, the information of cosmology into the genealogy and why you thought it was necessary to do so? Well, one thing is starting, well, if we start at a starting point, is um, what you have from the Simmons um, diversity project that have put a specific date that uh, Yorubas, for example, diverged. Um, I mean, the people who are called Yorubas now, because they weren't called Yorubas then, they, they split um, with um, the Pygmies, the, the sun, 
about 87,000 years ago. Now, what we know is that when we're talking about time, um, we, and we realize that the original timekeepers who are the calendar, the astrologers, and so on, and going with the binary, um, the, I mean, the binary system that the sun too has to rotate itself, which has been put in 26,000 years. Now, some people say that spiritual, some, some people may say they're just predictions in the sky. Well, from what we know now, with um, electromagnetic fields and hope, we realize that at each time in human history, we have um, different influences. Now, some people tie them to Shangon, we can them, you know, but depending on the language, well, you see, one basic thing is this, is that at the beginning, we we measure time with moons. And as we knew our environment, we extended it to planets. Now, whether you are in Roma, Greco, or, or any other civilization, the basic thing is that you have a circle which is divided into 12, conveniently. And those 12 um, sectors are given a name by each civilization. What is Shango in Yoruba is um, Aquarius, elsewhere is um, Majora, elsewhere. But they all point to the same spiritual essences. And, uh, and when I mean spiritual essence, I mean that we have influences, which some have put to planetary bodies, some have put to any other thing, but the different 12 sectors have different um, different uh, essences. So now, when we look at that, that we have this revolution in 26,000 years, then we now go back you understand and you realize that okay we had an iron age of 2000 years then we had the last 2000 years and when you look back and you go back 2000 years you can see that it does um correlate with that um that clock uh i mean that's a divided time um uh, you know into 12. now all i mean all what we are dividing at the end of the day is the evolution or the revolution of a body of a, you know, of a, of a celestial body you know in the moon you the moon then you have the heart that rotates 365 you have the i mean you have different planets then you now have the sun itself which, which people have said that according to binary that the sun too must have an opposite which revolves around and this, you know, this element, this trend is what human beings, you know, in ancient times for the spiritual. But I, as an economist, I just look at them as trends and that they have um, special influences or special characteristics. So, and that, and, and that is an easier way to go back into history. When you see that there's a trend, then you go back and then you can um uh calculate you know there may be there might be a longer trend than 26,000, but for the meantime and um as we think you know back with evidence that okay civilization started about ten thousand years uh, no about twelve thousand years then you have a uh, um time the counting of time and calendars about ten thousand years and you know yeah, exactly that. But what we're not testing to these two thousand years is another uh, um, sector of that um, twelve-hour uh, time, which we have agreed, you know, which we put into either Shango or Aquarius. But you see, at the end of the day, one thing we realized is that before you had religion, we had these timekeepers that uh, whether follow the sun or for you no know, any celestial and no matter what we can't discount 
what they had studied over thousands of years. You know, so we have to input it. If you see that, you know, at the beginning of the documentary, I said, we're going to use both modern and ancient systems to, uh, I mean, to give us a, a full, um, you know, a full a perspective. Yeah. I, I, I think, I, I guess it's the same um, thing with um, the Chinese, where they have the age of the different animals which come around every certain number of years, um, where they, I guess they're using cosmology to do it. But, uh, but back to, I guess, Namdi's question, he was trying to find out, uh, Namdi, about which age Shongu is in, and I was trying to pinpoint it here. Um, I don't know if you can answer that question. Now, if we're which yeah, age we're in, 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 your, in your documentary, you mentioned that um, the the era of uh, Shongo on a, a, and Amadioha or Baal, the Egyptian um, <coughs> uh, was supposed to run from 2007 um, to I wasn't too sure when it was supposed to elapse, but um, so I'm just trying to find out if we are still in that era or has that era elapsed. Yeah, just the, 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 the um, calculation from the trends, it was actually supposed to start uh, on August 11, 1999. But, you know, like I tell you that these are trends. There's also another trend which we've seen and, uh, have, you know, is undisputable, which is the trend of OEA, which actually starts these um, global structural changes and change in global consciousness. Now, this trend is about is roughly 250 years. Now, the last time we had it, before now, was, um, in, 19, was in 1770. That's when you had the United States. That's when you had the problem the beginning of the economy. At the beginning of the end of, um, of your empire, and so many things happened around 1770, which finally ended um, in the Haiti Revolution and the French Revolution. That was 1770. Now, if you look back 50 years earlier, you will see, I mean, we come to 1520. This was when we had the, the real beginning of slave trade. Um, and apart from slave trade, we had a uh, breakup of the Holy Roman Empire. And then, um, so many other things around that period again. If you look back at the fall 1520, then we now come down to about 1270. Um, the, the, the freedom of um, Granada, um, you know, and the rollback of Islamic um, stronghold from Europe. So, you now see that there's a 250 trend. I'm going to look at, you have age 250s in um, 22,000 year cycle. So, and if you now look back to that 2,000 year cycle, what happened, you know, from Julius Caesar to Jesus Christ at that time, you now look at it, you now realize that, okay, it seems this 250 year cycle, which Asians have said is the cycle of Oya, the cycle of Pluto, that uh, kickstarts a lot of things because you know it's the wind, it, 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 um, you know, the hurricane that brings down structures, and this is what we you, you understand. Now, when this uh, era of Shogo started in um, 1999, it wasn't energized, and it's always said that we're going to have to wait for Oya to come in to energize it. Not, not only to energize it, but to destroy the previous structures. So, and that is when Oya goes into, um, or you know, Western, um, Western astrology, when Saturn meets uh, Capricorn, which happens once in the, I mean, every 50 years. Immediately he started, he had the crash in um, 20, um, 2007, when he had the global economic meltdown and all, but people still knew that, look, there are still greater forces coming that when they actually, when those forces actually meet, they're going to have a total collapse of all systems, which is what happened in January 12, 2020, and what we're now witnessing with the corona 
um, virus and everything happened, that we expect that all world systems will crash from now on, and then a new system will develop from 2023 for the next uh, 2000 years. If you look at trends, you know, like an economics, I always tell you that look, we can we use trends, we understand, to know what, you know, to give us uh, I an mean, ability to forecast. It's not 100% that it's going to happen, but when you have trends and things happening over and over and over, and you can look at it, you can, I mean, you could um, bring. I mean, you can make a fairly safe picture that most likely all the people will just like happen again. Now, everybody, when we were telling them we did the video that look, in 20, um, that all the things are going to crash, people are like, and even, I have to tell you that even though it was there on the paper and it was showing, but even me, I had to wonder that, come on, how are systems going to collapse? Yeah, we saw how it collapsed in 1770. We saw how it collapsed in 1520, but modern times now, is that how is it going to collapse? But with Corona, we've seen that everything is just, uh, and definitely the system has collapsed. There is no way, I mean, already China was supposed to um, to overtake, uh, um, I mean, America this year from normal economic forecast. But with what has happened now, you can now say that definitely that change is going to come. And then when you now look at other trends and forecasts and things like that, you can see that that has come to pass, or it's coming, I mean, it's presently, it's presently acting out. But the most, uh, you know, as black people, is that where are we in all this? Well, I mean, I mean the area, as we said, that the area of cultural justice, you know, if there is economic, cultural, and political justice, black people will naturally rise because we have the resources, we have the, um, the, the know how and everything. But where we are now, and I'm waiting that uh, things will work out in our, I mean, our favor. But while doing that, and from my writing, I realized that look, the only way we can do this. You know, is that we have to unite. Now, our miseducation has made us not understand uh, that all original Africans, all the Niger Congo ethno linguistic group, are related. And some of these later day names, Yoruba, Igbo, blah, 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 that is splitting us. At, at, the, at the foundations of their culture, is the same. You know, you have the IFA, you have the laws of natural and retributive justice. You have you know, quite a lot of things that tie these people that look, we are only people dialects of each other. Now, oh, but, 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 so, so, sorry, I hope, you, I hope you wouldn't mind if I just asked you a question there, because in in one of your, your, your writings, you also say that the Yoruba and the Igbo are two of the same size of a, of a coin. Yep. But doesn't this sort of exclude all the other groups in the same region or that came from that, from, from, from them? No, or came from no, around, 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 around that region? We are, we are 2,240 groups. We have a population of uh, 700 million. Now, when I mention Yoruba and Igbo, this is the two largest groups. Now, it's going to be very difficult to list out all the 2,240 groups whenever I'm writing or talking. So I say, look, Yoruba and Igbo, and especially because these two groups are at loggerheads. So I mentioned them, but it includes, there's no way you're going to consider Yoruba and Igbo without calling, I mean, considering the jaw or the Gala or even all the way down to the Zulus, they're still the same people that migrated and we know how they migrated. We, we see how, how the linguistics change along the lines, you know, along these rivers. As a mountain, my, the mountain yeah. migration. Sorry? Is that, are you referring to the Bantu migration? 
I am I'm doing what please? Are you referring to the bound to migration? The bound to migration. Yes, yes. Yes, to so the bound to migration. Although you see, when we talk about the bound to migration, I do not um, really subscribe that it was five thousand years ago that the bound to migration occurred because those who who put a, a closer date to the map I mean to the bound to um, migration is that they are using what you call to chronology, which shows that um, every 1,000 years, languages change by 25%. So what they do is that when they look at the change in languages, they now calculate that term. But you see, that um, is based on the Indo-European Indo, um, model, which has a faster rate than ours, because the Indo-European model was mainly pushed by war so and that cultural culture i mean that culture and presence made those languages change faster but we um in origin africans we naturally spread it was a matter of the firstborn takes the net plot to learn so you, you, you know gradually move now people think that because those languages still have some semblance then they, then they didn't leave that uh, longer than enough. But there have been DNA studies that say that uh, we probably actually said that speaking about 50,000 years ago. This was by maybe and um, Silva, that the, you know, the group. And that's why, you know, I look at it that we followed, I mean, the, the um, pigments, the sun, um, they migrated in the front. And as you can see from this study, from um, Japan, at Kyoto University, um, I've forgotten his name now, that showed that, you know, when the pigments stay somewhere for 30 days, and they, I mean, I mean not, not, uh, for 90 days, they had enough to eat picking wild yams. Now, when they, you know, after eating, uh, no, as they eat the yams, they throw the, the lower parts away. And now the part where they told that uh, I mean those yams would provide yams for 35 years. Now what happened was you had um, the, the hunter characters in front and the bantus behind. So whenever they moved forward, they uh, took the place. And this is um, also back to Yoruba mythology about when they talk about a berry that uh, there's a, I mean, there's a mythology, I mean, there's a myth in, um, in uh, Yoruba culture that I always believe that if you wanted um, unlimited riches, go and take the mat, uh, the place where pygmies slept or, you know, temporarily resided and you'll be rich forever. This, I mean, you know, when you look at these oral traditions and you look at the science as well, you can see, okay, this is what they actually meant. Um, Prince Philoria, I'd like to ask something. I, I want to, if I could, I'd like to go back to kind of the original paradigm at the beginning of the show. One of the things that, that Eagle said at the very beginning was, he, he mentioned um, that you know, scientists kind of had positioned uh, humanity as more or less starting East Africa. Sometimes they would mention specifically, you know, Tanzania or somewhere between what we now know as the, the Congo and, and, and Tanzania. So um, since you obviously are not starting from that region, and then, of course, more recently, uh, you know, more uh, scientists have sort of um, rallied around the notion about what is present day Botswana, which most people would consider Southern Africa as being the, the origins of, of, of human beings. So since we aren't starting in those regions, East Africa, or what we now know as su Southern Africa, but we're starting with uh, the, the Nigeria area. Could you um, just sort of give me sort of like a little timeline that we start with the Nigeria area 
of the the birthplace, so to speak, regionally of human beings. Can you sort of say when you think human beings uh, sort of um, traveled from what we now know as Nigeria to East Africa, give me a timeline of when they arrived and then a timeline of when human beings arrived in, 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 su in Southern Africa. So that I'll get a sort of a, a idea about about the travel since you started the the location of human beings sort of differently than we generally read in in a lot of literature. Now you see, first we have to uh, understand one thing that um, Western academia basically tries to pull the Abhimik. Uh, religion, religious foundations, and dogma. They concentrated on um, Ethiopia and um, you know, in um, in uh, Tanzania for a very long time. They dug up uh, skeletons in Ethiopia, and it was very obvious that the only reason why they could get these skeletons in Tanzania and Ethiopia was that were very arid places. So um, we have skeletons that will, um, you know, will remain intact for millions of years. But it never showed that that was the object because you will find what you uh, search for. Now, when um, when this came up, you know, about Tanzania, you know, those dry lakes of Eastern Africa, Eventually, in 2002, we found the oldest skeleton called Tumei, T-O-U-M-A-I, um, in, I mean, in Chad. And it was from there when they came, uh, because it was a French sponsor, it, and it was there, the archaeology actually agreed that, look, we had neglected West Africa. We had not um, done any archaeological surveys in West Africa. And most of what was found in West Africa was by accident, like the Uleru, the Gokwe, um, cultures, or those, you know, they came about when people were building houses or they were mining and they found this. Um, uh, but you see, there wasn't the political will to prove that West Africa was the origin of humanity. Because once you do that, and this was one thing that I eventually realized when they refused to release the DNA, when they said shake mainstream beliefs. Because when you put the origin of humanity and civilization in West Africa, it means that the white man had absolutely nothing to do with it. That it was only an after you know, an afterthought and an after addition to it. So I realized then that there was that bias. Now, when the Botswana thing, that is a recent uh, uh, thing, and this came from what I said, uh, Tishkov. Now, I, you know, uh, from Tishkov's study. Now, she intentionally and mischievously added the Lemandi group, which is more towards, um, towards uh, East Africa, you know, which is, you know, around Gabon. And, uh, and, um, and Cameroon. Now she said they were, you know, she said they were the oldest, but when I looked at them, I was like, I've never heard of a group called the Mandy, and I realized after researching extensively that there was no group called the Mandy. And it was from the Le Mandy, the addition, it was from the fictitious addition of the Mandy that they were now able to, to say that if it was around that pub, then the nearest coast to that pub would be where the sun are in Botswana, and they come up with this thing that okay, look, they you know, even before actuality came out, they you now realized that one of the if there was going to be evolution, it had to be near the sea because there's some chemicals from the sea that are in our area of genetic makeup. So, this um, origin has to be around the sea. They brought up, uh, you know, you know, like recently last year, they said, oh, there was a former, there was a former um, uh, huge lake around Botswana, and that's where they got it. 
I know I've had this argument with some people in South Africa, and I was like, okay, let me ask you this question. What was the fuel of evolution? What food did they eat? And the only, I mean, some will say, oh, they had um, shrimps, they had prawns. It's like, come and get out of here. How can you say human beings grow or evolved on shrimps? You know, you know, there's like they had to have a carbohydrate, and they had to have a protein. You understand? And you know, from the study, it shows that it was yams. Now, where is the existence of yams? Nigeria produces 70% of the world's yams. And it's always produced those 70% of those water because it's a low land rainforest. Now, you can't use um, uh, Congo because Congo is a highland rainforest, so it has less oxygen. And uh, there's some crops that are not. Uh, so what we had, and if you look at, you know, is that coming out from the lowland rainforest, which is also the largest mangrove, largest continental mangrove and fresh water swamp. So you have all this in one location, but now you're trying, you know, when it was Ethiopia, when it was Ethiopia and the uh, and you, see, and you see another thing again was that from the first humans, it showed from their dental structure that they lived in the rainforest. The dental structure grew, I mean, I mean, without doubt, said they were rainforest. So they said, okay, the rainforest was Congo to the left, but the ocean is uh, uh, the Somali coast to the west, uh, I mean, to the uh, right. So, you know, the, they came together. The same thing with this Botswana thing. But you see, I've come to realize that one thing is that just like what happened with our political, you know, when we were taking our independence and they tried to um, to break the uh, cultural unity being brought by um, by uh, um, Namdi Azikwe and Nkuma, you know, uh, from West, they realized that one thing that if West Africans unite the black race, white supremacy toast. So they always um, try and distract from that. And when you talk about the timing, you see, I know one thing is that, because even when you talk about the Yoruba's 87 death, they said plus or minus 50,000 years. But one thing is this, apart from the absolute time, what we have to look is what was the dynamics. If it was 300, 500, a thousand years, almost fifteen thousand years, is that you know it started from here and it started going like that. Now, when we look at um, the East African, because when you look at the East Africa and South Africa, all I mean the sun are only about five hundred thousand, and all the pigments. Now, one thing again that is being overlooked is that. The sun are the pigments that did not mix. The the source the source of um, all sands, which would have been Nigeria, made them mix. So we now have a mixture of the tall, uh, um, I mean, the full statue uh, Africa and the small Africa. And how you can know that there is that mix is that the pigments are the ones. With the protruding acid, I mean, the protruding backside, because that's where the store part. Now, when you see that mixture, you see Nigerian men, um, um, Nigerians and Ghanaians who at all have that big ass. That is the pygmy input. And because this is like a melting point, we all mix together. But those who migrated remained um, that. And you know, until you get to Botswana, when you now look at um, even the Bantu, uh, I mean, the Bantu in Botswana, they have that big um, backside. So, but like I said, you know, if we're to follow DNA evidence and put the timing, we look at um, 100, 120,000 years ago, some say 200,000 years, but the migration always had to be from 
uh, I mean, from West Africa down the road. I see if the largest population of um, of uh, the majority of Africans came from east to west, you will have you have the cultural imprint, the cultural bit. But what you have is the stronger culture, I and mean, not so much the older culture coming from west to east. Whenever you look at, uh, I mean, like for example, when you look at the Congos, the Congos will tell you that they come from from uh, from the Teal Confederacy up into the uh, Gabon, uh, uh, the Gabon, Ganga River um, area. If you look at uh, the East Africans, the Kukuyu, the um, the band, I mean the I mean Bandas, you realize that they are that uh, I mean they split from what we call the the Masariki, the Masari, the Masariki Bantus. Now the Masariki Bantus came along that river, they initially stayed around the um, Great Lakes River, then they dispersed. That's where you have them, then they want the um the Sukuma in Tanzania, you know, went down towards uh, the state because you see what happens uh, they, they will move, they will stay in a place for about a thousand or two thousand years, then they will move again. We still have that population, but then they will split into another thing, and then language changes a bit. And this is what happened, you know, when they got down to um, uh, the Botswana area before the split into the Guni, the uh, Zulu, you know, because the Zulu, the Pedi, the um, the Axosa, they're all the Gunis. Now, they speak from that Botswana place where the first day of that. So, you can see how how each of these groups, you know, migrated. And now, um, what one thing we know, of the origin of the Bantus in uh, East Africa, which were the uh, Masariki, was that they brought yam and uh, iron implements. You know, iron so they started the farming, but they still had that link to those on the upper Congo um, basin and to Gabon. And you can see how the names change. You have in Ibo, you have Mweni, you know, you have that Mweni, Mwes, you know, and mm -mm, the head of the the clans all the way down to South Africa. And you see how that name changes. So when you look at it, I mean, like I've always said, there are two things. The two most important uh, is one, DNA, which is our blood, and two, uh, the language, which is our. Uh, now, you will always, you can always trace from language. And when I want to come together, then you have um, your solution. I, I do. Um, Hello? Yeah, yeah, yes, we can hear you. Sorry. No, um, yeah, it's, it's quite interesting. I do, I do have some. I do, I do acknowledge that um, according to language, well, first of all, the DNA prevalence um, or dominance, I think, or, of, of diversity dissipating over the distance does owe to your theory and also um, the language clusters uh, changing over time. You say the IFA uh, uh, model system was also carried through as well as the uh, cultivation of yams as well, and, and the yam cultivation is very strong uh, or very, very prevalent in, in West Africa. Um, how has this been received, your theory, in um, literary circles with other authors in the media? I know you've written about it. How has it been received? Has it been uh, wide acceptance? You see, it's, it's received as I would love it to be received. Um, I don't expect the white man to accept that uh, 
he came afterwards or to support something that we not me. As you know, I wrote the book when I was living in New York and uh, we're living in London, you know, I published it. And, but I think the most important thing is um, in Nigeria, among uh, the cultural and the political elite, they have sat down and thought about it. And even among Africans, when you know, when other Africans, they see, they know, it was that they, you know, they have that feeling. But you see, we we still operate a Eurocentric um, uh, system in Africa, and it's like until the white man says it is not uh, full. But I have not. I mean, initially I tried to to have a Western acceptance, but like even the Western acceptance will not mean anything. It has to be accepted by my people before Western, and especially when I can see like like the, uh, the situation where I told you about them inputting a non-existing loop, demanding in those figures, you know, which really shows that, look, because you know what happened was, when they came out and they didn't leave in 2003, I was writing letters, I was, uh, you know, I having this campaign in London that now you have to believe it and blah, blah. And when they now, when they now released it, and they now put in this, the man, they was like, these people will go, you know, they'll go to every land. Even if, if God, if a voice opens up on me, you know, in the sky now and says, this is the black people of West Africa, that's what the white man will say he's a devil. They will say, you no, know, because, and you see, it's only when I actually put this knowledge to use, I realized that this was the immense power that they were scared of. And then I now see the reaction to it. You know, when I was like, you know, being able to put the on your the um of uh Onisha is the the um the Akuka, the Jaws, I want to be able to put them together, I realized that there has been nothing that has riled the Afrasiatic North. And they actually are scared. And then, you know, you know, and when you see the reaction, even from Britain, where immediately they call him or me to come and talk about the, uh, the, the significance and relevance of traditional institutions in democracy. You realize that, oh, these people actually know that this is the main tool, that this is the main problem that we have. That if Nigeria, which is by far the largest and has the groups, if it can get itself together, then all these things about Britain being a whole new group, no, won't really matter. Ever since I got them together, I just didn't even bother about uh, what is happening in Britain America anymore because I like them. They can complain about white supremacy and the power is reverse. If we ah. unite, we will back people on the south and middle belt. We will take over Nigeria. We will unite the rest of Africa into a group. And then we will get to you know, we'll move away from this label of being tribes into a full fledged civilization of um, African uh, nations. But because we cannot articulate our culture beyond our tongue, we are called tribes. Because we don't know that uh, the symbol of our civilization, the leopard, is shared from here to South Africa and across. You know, we believe we don't have, um, we all look at it as a some clan, uh, some clan idea that. But when you look at it and you understand the cultural terms of what makes it, what's the difference? Because, you know, there are differences between original African and traditional civilization to all other um, uh, civilizations. Like, like I pointed out, we believe in the duality of uh, nature. We believe God is good and bad. We don't believe in nature. We don't believe in, um, in the messianic uh, justice. We believe 
that whatever comes around goes around, which all ties to the circle. We, you know, we have, we have a, what we call binary mentality, whereas they have a, a kind of linear, uh, linear. Uh, linear. Yes, they have a linear ideas, and you understand they are gates. I mean, you know, to us, we believe good and bad make one. Because for one part, to so them, they believe that good is the opposite and or bad and cannot more have to repair and there's nothing like compromise but uh i mean you have to so there are these things that when you look at to all african um, uh, uh societies either in africa or even in diaspora there are these natural things i mean as you know about when i've been to i mean i live in the united states i lived you know i've met and you know in england i was born in england when I meet with other people, I just realized that there's this natural affinity, that you know, unspoken uh, kind of way of life, even though it may be covered up in uh, Abrahamic, uh, but there are ways and things that I read. And when I now go down to an Afrojatic territory, I feel exactly the same way like I feel when I go to a KKK um, gathering. So there are these natural things that even, you know, but you see, the, one of our greatest problems is because that most of us have grown up in a you know, uh, system and we naturally just don't want to accept it. But when I talk to people who are just Africans, who are just, who are not really uh, been dogmatized in the, you know, the European uh, system, they're like, oh, I've always suspected that he was, have a, you know, it was like, oh, I've always suspected that next time that we are related. And, you know, I mean, look at that. You see that these things are so clear. And the Europeans have made what is so easy to be um, complex. You understand? I mean, like, I know if I was saying that, look, if you look at the planet Earth, and if, if you look at uh, uh, the map of, I think, naturally, if you're going to look at which place gave birth, to have I mean, to humanity to be just right above the middle of it, which is where and that and there's so many things that um that you know there's only way you go to you realize that these things are right there in your nose, know, but they've made it so difficult. It's like oh, how could we have evolved from an arid path? Because the whole of East Africa is about lake, dry I mean the lake, I mean it's a dry part. I mean, there's with lakes. So, 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 because the rain. Because the rain. You understand? The rain comes from the Atlantic. Whereas yeah. the rain that feeds East Africa has to go over Eurasia and it's really, really scanty. The only reason why you even have Ethiopia not being part of Sahara Desert is because it's elevated land. And that's why you even have that East Africa because it's elevated last so week gets more rain. Mm. But now they will now try to tell you that uh, the I mean you, you have five hundred languages here out of the I mean out of the two thousand you have about five hundred languages here, and they now have um, maybe a hundred in Kenya or uh, and you, you now expect that people now left from there to here. I used to say, I mean, it should be from the most fertile region, the most population, the most diverse, to the other side. So it's, you understand, when you look at it, you realize that it's natural. And that's the only way, it's only when you look at it from a West African point of origin that you can actually understand the full fear of, uh, of the black race. And that's, you know, that's where you can see that, oh, because, but when you're looking from East Africa, or from Northeast Africa, or from South Africa, or from, uh, you know, from Botswana, you get to a point that, okay, how did this happen? Okay, why do you have that population here? Why do you have this there? Why do you have that there, but not there? And you see certain things that, until, because now when I pick up a book about Africa, but once somebody starts, so that we came from Egypt, or we came from the desert, into the rainforest, where well, we know that 
you cannot live in this rainforest from outside because you need the sickle cell gene, you know, against malaria to survive. Now, how will people move from savannah into the rainforest? So people move out from the rainforest into the savannah and they try to um, adapt their food. Um, with, I mean, if you look at Yorubas and Igbos, uh, you know, the two largest uh, Niger Congo groups, they don't have words for rice. They are lactose intolerant. And there's no way you would have come from Northeast or you've come from um, Botswana without having grains, without um, uh, being involved in the cow complex. What did they eat? You must have nothing apart from yam and palm oil. And also, you know, yam is the largest uh, uh, carbohydrate. Then you have palm oil. When you look for the um, the thing with the highest protein content, the food with highest protein is from here, the termites. Termites have 94%. You know what you call it, so termites and those uh, migrants from uh, palm trees. They have 90 something percent protein. So you're trying, you know, what the Eurocentric media is now trying to tell me that people left uh, these obvious building blocks of evolution, of genetic evolution, you understand, to go, you understand, it doesn't make a sense. And that's why they're, they're you know, anyone from West African origins does not make uh, sense. Yeah. So, so, so on, on that Garden of Eden part, so are you, are you then saying it's largely because of the vegetation or were there any kinds of uh, resources that were there that also makes, makes you say that it was the Garden of Eden? It's, it's the okay. geography. Okay. You understand? It's the geography. It's the vegetation, the food, the... You, you, you understand? It had to be the most um because you see we have epochs of uh, climate and one thing we know is that even after the initial evolution we had as we had a time where the you know where we went into the ice age and the only people who survived were those who survived close to the desert because every, everywhere in the world was dry after the indonesian super explosion which blocked sun rays and that was when the European ran into the caves in um, Central uh, Asia, the Andronovo complex. So, but we, we were able to um, to survive at the mouth of uh, Niger, you know, you know, uh, lower. If you look at uh, the Congo River, and the, you see the Niger River is the only delta in Africa that comes out in a rainforest area. Is the only major river that comes out in the rainforest. The river Congo uh, Delta comes out in Savannah. It comes out, you know, around um, you know Angola. The Mpopo comes out in, uh, you know, you know, um, a semi-arid region. Nile comes out, uh, you know, in the Mediterranean. So I see one thing we know is that rivers. The rivers uh, came before us. The rivers had formed millions of years ago. So, I, I, I know, like when I said, the Tume, the skeleton found in Chad, is the near, because it's believed that um, monkeys, and uh, I mean, the cutoff of monkeys and human beings was about. Seven million years ago, about seven million, seven point five million. That was when that changed. Now the nearest that missing link was to me, which was found in Chad. But they didn't go up row and say, "Oh, to me, no," because it does not fit the agenda of white supremacy of pushing a brown. Oh no, because what academia actually tries to do is to make that look yes the Abrahamic ideas are true, even though they are not, you understand, uh, you know, but that's another story. But that is what they had concentrated on, to prove, to look for the lost city of David, uh, lost, you know, to prove where they are. And that's why, even up to now, they try and make that distinction, that clear, I mean, that distinction between 
the Koreans and uh, the full scale Afghans. And I don't know whether you read that article where I said we have to be very careful because right now, what the European is doing to us in South Africa is trying to, to say that uh, the Koreans came from South Africa, but the Bantus came from Nigeria. So is the is the is the uh, hunter gatherers that own the gold in South Africa, and that's why we say no. Both the pigments and bantus came from West Africa. Don't try and say no. Uh, no, the pigments came from here, uh, but the Negroes they came from. So the Negroes. So when you when you push that argument, when you follow the East Africa and South Africa claims. What is eventually going to be is that the West Africans or the Bantus are uh, just as visitors as the white people there. So it's the pigments who own the land, and they already had the pigments under there because they're a small number. They already had them, and that's one thing that that even in the parliament now, when um, uh, Malema and Co are trying to push for reparations. They, they've been promoting some people to say, no, the reparations, we own the land and we don't want reparations and we don't want the land back. Uh, the, the Bantu does not, has no claim to the golden diamonds just as the white man doesn't have to. So you see, and this is what I always tell people is that you see, history, politics, academia really always has an academic, uh, um, we always have a political or racial title. Even in medicine, even when when they uh, took our Chopin uh, into vaccination in Boston in 1720, uh, Cotton, they couldn't tell them that this was a black uh, science because the people were going to say it was black magic. So they had to Yes, that was pass it to England, then come back and say it was the English who invented vaccination. But it was clear that Mata had took that uh, procedure, the vaccination procedure, which was uh, the the um, foundation of the medicine from West Africa. Yeah, you're right. So you're, you're, you're right. Even Benjamin Franklin, if you read Benjamin Franklin's um, autobiography. He mentioned it in his book about coming in contact with um, an African and enslaved African in the Americas who had been vaccinated, and he was, you know, he was quite surprised to see that um, vaccination for the Negroes was not something that was um, uh, that was that was new to, to Africans. Africans had always had some form of vaccination. And so, if you read, but if you read Benjamin Franklin's autobiography book. You will see. Uh, he even mentioned about. I mean, he mentioned this about you know his encounter with an enslaved African in the Americas who had already gone through vaccination in Africa before he came to the Americas. Actually, from what we gather, they paid a higher price for Africans with vaccinations at the ports. They knew that they had a greater resistance because you know we always had this what we call very these decisions where they rob the thing and they have this. Uh, so these were things that were were commonplace in the major groups in Africa. But when they came, they don't you know, they never want to attribute it to the African. And that's the same thing where we now got to the core that, okay, where does Africa call to go? And you see this is one thing when, when we were going, um, you know, during the civil rights movement, they purposely, Moved Africans or distribution or disseminated the, the African diaspora to go to Eastern Africa instead of um, of uh, the Zik and the Nkuma, They promoted uh, um, Selassie and others. You understand that that was the home of uh, black. Now, a lot of um, uh, black diaspora went there, but they realized that look, there was this same um, mulatto issue and that they couldn't be fully accomplished. 
and that uh, what was I mean the only thing they were handing me was Christianity that uh, you took care of and I see but until until we can have that link of where Yoruba land because Yoruba land no matter how it is it's still the most prosperous land in black Africa and you have Igbos who are one of the most um, enterprising and prosperous people you know at all the those two groups can come together because when you go down to east africa you see them there when you go down to south africa you see them there you see them everywhere and it is them through their economics through their political uh, i mean the social fluidity that can actually unite that um african uh, civilization i want to say and i'm not talking about you know, you know, uniting like having like a empire, but what I see is that we were supposed to work towards a continent-wide, um, you know, a continent-wide self-determined uh, city-states, where each group, each culture has self-determination within, the, like that's the only way we can win. But unfortunately, the one of the things the European pushed us into is what they call pan-tribalism. Instead of pan Africanism, you have pan tribalism, and Yoruba is now focused on the Dua Republic. Uh, Igbo is focused on, um, on Biafra, which can never work because you cannot fight as one tribe against a cultural sphere. What you have is that you have the European cultural sphere, and the cultural sphere, you have the Afrasian cultural sphere. The, the Afrasian cultural sphere, even though we find it you know led by the Fulani and the Hausa has been the largest Africa. Until Africans, until original Africans, the Niger Congo as a linguistic group can come together and articulate what their culture is, has been the false culture in the world, then it's only that time you can break the Afro-Shati uh, between those who want to stick to the Shati part and those who want to take to the African part. And is that that is only that time that we can truly be free. Otherwise, when you take up numbers, if you look at the numbers of Hausa and Fulani all the way down to um, Yemen, I mean, to uh, to Medina, to, there is no way this Niger Congo groups can win. So they have to come together because all these names, the name Yoruba was not used to, uh, to the 1700s, the late 1700s. I am from Accra, from Accra Kingdom, and my fathers and my, they don't take, even though we come under Yoruba, they don't, they will tell you that uh, they are different, that the Yoruba languages are your language, and we are different. So what we had was city-states, but we, we, we worked as a civilization together because we had the same modern understanding of life, we had the same perspective, so we did not need to go and uh, divide Yoruba had never given, until the Europeans came in uh, the 15th century. We didn't need to do that. We we, we had enough land, which up to, you know, up to now we still can't fully exploit. But when you look at starting from the middle, I mean from from Sudan, so you have only one river, and with only one river, you have to have control. Otherwise. You understand, but here you have a thousand rivers. If any king decides to be over, overly tyrannic, then we, you know, we move to the next river. But in those um, uh, northern Africa and Eurasia areas, that control, and that's why when you look at, you know, they had to, they had to do it. They had to control the source of water. And from the source of water is where you now have. People being pushed into the same religion and same, you understand, and imperialistic uh, movements. Yeah, just a quick question. Just a quick question. So, okay. based, based on this, your analysis about the need for the, uh, this Niger Niger Congo, the, the various ethnic uh, nationalities that exist within the Niger Congo, the need for them to uh, uh, to come together. Do you see? Is there a possibility that we can have this kind of um, unification with the Afro-Asiatic groups? 
the Afro-Asiatic groups that we see that are operational or that, are, that have settled in Africa in the last couple of centuries. Do you think that that kind of unification with the original Africans, that's the Niger Congo group, or the Bantus and these Afro-Asiatic groups? Well, so far, I've spoken to the cultural leadership, I've spoken to the political leadership, and they really are for it. So what, what the only thing we need to do is um, the masses. I want the masses know, but you see the problem about it is that many of the elite get their power from Islamic and uh, Islam uh, forces. So they were always prepared, but you see, from what we're seeing now, it will eventually have to happen. Now, when it comes to the Afroisha, you know, because we also have two types of Afroisians. We have those who are by DNA Afroisha, those are the Fulanese or the, uh, the Somalis in some cases, where they have where they have a significant portion of their blood, of their DNA, being shattered. Then you have the larger um, body of Afro-Asians who are just Afro-Asians by language. And uh, because they lost the original African um, culture, or in most cases, because the Hausa is the largest Afro-Shattered group in the world. But we, have, but we know that Hausas have the same kind of system that we have. But because they're suppressed by the, the Islamic um, uh, imperialists, these um, these vestiges of uh, you know these uh, surviving cultures are pushed out. Now, when original Africans come together and push that original African uh, culture and tell all those other boys that look, we need freedom of worship, and you back those original of those time. The Africans, the, the who want to hold on to the African uh, side, when you back them up, then they will have a voice to speak, and then you realize that even the so-called Afro-Asians, many of them, because even the Afro-Asians realize that yes, we are Afro-Asians, but we are not accepted by the Asiatics. But they, yeah, so an example are the ones like uh, like, like Malians, I think the ones you're yeah. describing. Yeah. So Sorry. you see. They are in between, but because they can always run to the white masters and say, no, you know, we're half related, let me be the one to, I mean, let me be the foreman of the full African, but he's not going to be an equal to the shattered. Now, when the African snatches himself, unites himself, articulates his culture, I say, look, no, we're not just takers, we're not just from the street, we have an authentic knowledge bank, a, an advanced social system which is still effective up to today because the latest technology, what we're talking about, yeah, the information on the retrieval system is still based on IFA, which is a 256 pulses sent by IFA. So when, when you articulate that culture and make people proud of it and you can see that it can actually be a source of power, you realize that majority of Afro-Asians, just like African-Americans, Will tell you that hey I'm, I'm i'm african i'm not american you understand they will take pride in it but if the original africans do not articulate their african culture then they cannot expect the africans to take the africanists you understand because it's going to be a look your your and in most cases from what we see in the dna the african side is the mother side it's like oh your mother uncle were the animals if we didn't but if you can say no, we were more um, developed. We had, you understand, all you had was the force of, I mean, the, the force of guns and the swords that you're not. He will be able to, he will feel comfortable. Nothing tells him not to still use his Asiatic advantages, but we will know that his Africanness is also a strong, viable um, civilization. Okay. But, uh, Oh, sorry, I just have a, I have a couple of things to say um, so we'll, before we close soon. Um, I don't know if you, you've watched, but we've had a few shows um, on, on a concept called Bantu Federation, which is uh, uh, very similar to what you've, just, you've been discussing. We've all had that, and uh, Baruti and myself as well, uh, talking about uh, all the individual nation states, you call them city states, uh, which are the cultures 
having their independence, but all coming underneath one federation, and it will be separate from the Afro-Asiatic. This, this, this was um, the, the proposal, so, so to speak. And um, it is quite similar to what you are describing. And I also think that that's, um, that that's the only way forward. Um, obviously, the, the countries we have now, the borders are all from the Berlin Conference and have not been working to our benefit so far um, with neocolonialism holding them together as we speak. Um, so it's just good to hear that. Um, the, uh, the other thing final for me was, okay, now that you've been, you've been, um, you've developed this, or oh, you've done some research and, and come up with this um, uh, theory or to yourself, this, this um, realization, and you've spoken to a few um, cultural um, um, heads or, 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 or traditional heads about it, and some have been in agreement and they've all been coming together. What, what do you see as a future of this? Do you, where do you want this to go? Do you want it to, to get into the educational system? Do you want to more focus on the political system for this to be introduced in there? Where do you see this going? I'm not, I'm, I'm before, you, I'm before you answer that question, let me just add, add mine, because I think it's just piggybacking on uh, Igor's question. What is the significance, still of the future, what is the significance of 2023? You kept on mentioning 2023. What is the significance of 2023 and its, and its effect on, on, on Africa or the black world in general? Okay. Now, um, I mean, the first question is the, the traditional rulers, like I said, have, you see, before we can get into the curriculum, we actually have to have the power because those who, what we have in the curriculum was put there by imperialists, uh, either Islamic or um, Europeans, and it was a matter of power. They didn't just put it in there, they put it in there to um, culturally confuse us, just like they did to the houses, who they now call all their relatives and uh, Baza, I mean, they called Baza Bakwa and Baza, uh, I mean, and the Bakwa, I say, I'm not forgot, but some are bastards, rather, as uh, the insult. Now, when we talk of, you know, it's on all, uh, levels. Now, what we first have to do is that we need the public awareness, the, the comprehensive, massive public awareness to teach the people. Now, um, this is not something that is, I mean, unless you want to go really deep into it, because you see, when um, the European wanted to leave the shadow of um, black Egypt, we created a region and which in most cases nobody could read the bible was what they were just been told so our message just need you know to have that notification from their opinion leaders from the cultural leaders that look you are related this is your relation this is your relation this is your relation this is how we develop we are back you, you understand now it that would help in the political um sphere because we will know even though we already know we that for example where we are all um asking for restructuring to you know to true federalism and uh you understand we realize that the south and middle belt have the same um collective aspirations now what we need the political class to know even though they come and they have this united form is that look you need to base this um, this unity, this political unity on cultural unity, because that's the only time that it's going to stand firm. Because if it's only with political horse trading that we come together, then the any of the, any of the imperialists would come up and give one of us a better um, deal. To and if you don't have that cultural, but once it's made cultural, it's that like, we are my brother. And if you sell out, you're selling out the family. So you build, you know, because we've always had these uh, political alliances, and uh, but if they are not steeped in um, culture, they're not steeped in blood, which is what um, the Fulani, or what the whites, the Eurasians, 
you know, and every other civilization always have that blood lining. What you have that strong political alliance in Africa, it has to be by blood. And this is what we call cultural, cultural nationalism. It has to be cultural. The whole of what is based, you know, on the conservatism that was built in the 1800s by uh, by Queen Elizabeth's uh, family. So they, you understand, the things that money can't buy, and that's the only way because, and that's the only way we can have a strong enough unity with the realization that look, this is my brother. This we 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 come from the same uh, place and we go to the same place. You see, one of the problems that the African um, politician has is that he cannot say, he, you know, he cannot give you the full narrative. He doesn't know who you are. He doesn't know where you're coming from. He doesn't tell you where you're going. You understand? And even in that, he doesn't even know where he wants to go. He's just telling you where he wants to go to, according to the prescribed of his Eurocentric uh, perspective. You need a complete narrative from the beginning to present. Because you see, most people can't even read this constitutional agreement. What is that? Look, my brother is my brother. We are one, we are one. We are we really people. That is how you're going to mobilize the masses. Not coming down and speaking all these big uh, political phrases and expect. And you see, and, the, and that's why when you realize that it is easier for the northerner to um, mobilize these people and the southerner. Because the northerner only hear that the, some people who are not from a proper progress wants to destroy us. But what the southerner wants to talk is like, oh, uh, another person in the, in the platform, in the foreign platform we are, is an opponent. And so, no, it's not saying that, look, this is, this is your identity. This is, this is a fight for your ancestors and your descendants. That's why this. Um, now, what we have planned to do is, um, is that we have to have a massive public awareness program, which you can see we've been trying to do. And this goes with the timing, which now goes to the second question, and uh, that um, uh, what is 2023? Like I said, the, uh, the new age is really going to be activated in 2023. This is when um, Pluto, you know, moves into um, into uh, into Aquarius. This is the real start of the age of Aquarius. Now, this the last time we had this was when we had the uh, Haiti Revolution. It was under that influence, and if you remember from the Haiti Revolution, we came together on our original African foundation. And that's what we put with. That seven day open festival in uh, you know, in the Northern Haiti uh, from August, uh, August 14 to August 21, 1791. Now we are coming to that point again in 2023. But this time around, this is actually a chain. It's not only a 250 year chain, it also goes to a 2000 year change. And if you look at what happened in 2000, I mean, uh, exactly 2000 years ago, we realized that this was the time when the Romans, when the Roman Republic imploded and they had a civil war and it's now started moving on forward. Now, it's likely that in 2022, well, if we don't go, um, the, the, the structure, of that revolution is already building now. Once uh, uh, Babalai um, started moved into, into um, Shango's house on March 21st, now what we're going to have is that things are going to, um, you guys are going to dimmer, you know, you know, come to a boil. And what I can see with the present is that this um, lockdown. Now, the coronavirus has already put us in the way. It's going to turn it. If you don't lock us down, we're going to have a huge, I mean, we might have a huge uh, uh, amount of people, you know, infected. But if you lock down, 
lock, so that idea of lockdown is not us. It will lead to revolution. And if, and if you remember when I said that uh, when they, they that explosion, when white people ran into caves to survive, we stayed outside there. We stayed outside. And this, uh, and you see, uh, like I'm writing an article, this is going to be the last straw of trying to bring foreign methodologies and foreign ideas into Africa when they don't go you know, without looking at it. Now, we are going to go into um, lockdown, which we started here in Lagos, and it's not going to, there is no way they can survive a month or even two months in lockdown. So what they're going to have, and already, is already painted, is that the, it's these um, rich elites who travel abroad, who brought this thing down the world. The common man does not have a passport, so he could never have caught corona. But you, you take all the money, you go down uh, to England and America, you're now bringing disease. You are the ones who are supposed to be dying, but you are kicking us indoors and want to kill us with anger. So already you realize that you will not have um, the kind of unity of purpose that you have in uh, Europe, Asia, or America towards the virus. It's going to be a class thing. And this uh, lockdown would definitely provoke the, the um, masses. Now, it's between now and 2023 when actually that thing is supposed to explode. And we also have what we call the, um, the decade, the, the, the great decade of transformation. So there are many things that are supposed to happen between now and 2020. As number one, you have all the systems collapse. Already we, we have uh, the West has been um, demystified because everybody is like, ah, evil. there is nothing that can defeat the white man. He is the greatest and he is going to rule forever. But what has happened with the corona now, the African is like, wow. So these people are not that uh, invincible. Then they've seen the Abrahamic religions that they were saying that, oh, the God of all ages, and they really realize that they have no cure or power to it. And when you now shifts, when the power now shifts from the West to China, because you see, China has a closer cultural foundation to we Africans because they. Because all that we do is they came from afar. It came when when the uh, Europeans came, uh, I mean, Eurasians came into, uh, into present day Pakistan and India and adopted Ifa, the, the, uh, the tenets of Ifa in what they call the Rig Veda, which will now become the source of Buddhism. But you see that if you look at Buddhism, it's out of all the religions in the world, Buddhism is the closest to Ifa. Because they have this uh, different, uh, um, you know, uh, pathways, and they also don't believe in the concept of the devil or fighting for their god, you know. Whereas we know that the resources, so they, I mean, they, I mean, they don't have that. Now, when the Africans see that, oh, it's not just Christ that makes it developed already. Global, our global conscious, our collective consciousness, is under. I mean, it's changing. As we speak now, people are thinking that, wow, I thought, I thought uh, that the deal was just kill one person with his prayer, and it, but it's not happening, and it's not going to happen. So when when all this happens, we, they now become invisible, and then the African can, uh, you know, with the right information, that kind of say, oh, so I don't need to, to be a white man to develop, and then you're going to see that change. Both, I mean, it's first going to happen mentally, but if some people now, just like what I suspect that happen now, they now don't want that that uh, mental transformation, that cultural transformation to happen, then it will get violent, because the people are not going to, to allow, you know, they've seen it, and they are not going to remain rooted to um, the bottom ladder of humanity anymore. So I see that by 2023, um, we might, I mean, what Asher Foundation is that, I mean, is hoping is that we can have enough time to educate the people. Because we know definitely there's going to be anarchy. We know there's going to be, and you know, there's always anarchy, but 
you always have to control that mindset so it doesn't just wander off into endless anarchy or being uh, hijacked by those with uh, ulterior foreign motives, you know, whether by the Chinese or by the whites or, or, or whoever. We have to take control. And that's why Ashe Foundation has taken the paramount leader of each group to make, and um, the paramount leaders also have or to, I mean, their own um, self-interest, because if their culture, if they can rise, then they become more important. They will regain their power, you understand? So they too are motivated to push, you know, and to be part of it. Because already they realize that the Eurocentric um, politicians are making a rubbish of them. You understand what I'm saying? Is that so? I, I mean, I believe I'm, I'm hopeful that by 2023 later, we will see. But I mean, what I say is that I'm definite that by the end of this decade that we have started, there will be a great change. Press the lawyer. Press the lawyer. Uh, just sneak in um, two two questions that I would like to get your your brief responses on. Um, let, let me ask both of them, and if you need me to repeat any of it, I, I will. Okay. Um, in, in terms of the the integration of of, of African peoples. Where, where, where is this misconception coming from that West Africa, or amongst West African peoples, that they are different completely linguistically from, say, Central, East, and Southern parts of, of Africa? Um, you know, as though, for example, in Nigeria and, say, Ghana as principal places, many people would reject the notion of they being called or affiliated with being Bantu. They would look at that and say, okay, that's restricted to Central Africa, East Africa, and, and Southern Africa. Where is this misconception coming from? That's the, that's the first- It comes from the misconception. And the first- It comes second. from the misconception. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. When, did you want me to give the second one? Yeah, go ahead, Bruce. Go ahead. Yeah, then I want to Okay. And the and the second one was um, you mentioned earlier about um, like paradigms. You mentioned good and bad, for example, and you mentioned that you know in African philosophy, good and bad would be complementary ideas. But in the Caucasian uh, concept of that, they would be opposite. Okay, can you can you give a couple of uh, examples or an example of those being played out as a social paradigm? You know, like an example where good and bad is is sort of acted out as complementary in an African sense. And then where good and bad is thought of differently as as opposite. Th those are my two okay. questions. The first question is a simple one. Um, we identify ourselves by the name of our, the owner of our plantation. Uh, we don't see ourselves as we. We see that okay, he's. Because when you look at South Africa, East Africa, well, they were they were they were named by outsiders. Yoruba seems to be related to those. You know, it's all about self. Some of it's about self uh, impurity complex, about self hatred. We don't like our reflections. You understand? And we, because we can't hate ourselves, we hate anything that looks like us. When you hear you guys talk about ego, you know, and I say you guys like, well, you guys do the same thing. So we have this, um, there's this divisive thing that, that and it of comes down to that origin that, well, um, we come from Abrahamic sources, and uh, you understand, we, we define ourselves according to that nation or that label that they give. But all these labels, 
of this tribal slavery, they don't really matter. I mean, they don't mean anything. We understand. You see, the problem is this: is that we modern African doesn't even understand his culture. Like if a Yoruba, I mean, if if the European and the Arab never came, if I would have been our knowledge bearer, and then I would have known easily that this thing, if I when I have my sixteen thing, if I met another evil man, I mean, if I met an evil, or if I met a a and I saw the same sixteen, he would be like a Christian who sees a cross. But I don't even. As a modern um, African, I don't even know the totems or the foundations or the identity of the culture that I profess. The only thing I do is speak the language. And and because I cannot understand that dialect, I believe we're different. But if I look into my culture and if I understood what Yoruba culture is fully, I would not look at a Congolese or uh, a Kenyan as different. Because if I knew it, I would know about Japan. And if I know about Japan, I would realize that the Japan culture and uh, uh, you understand, like I said, it changes myself. Just like a Christian can know, um, you know, from uh, from an Irishman to a, to a Greek to um, a Russian. When he sees the cross, when he sees some type of things, he understands it. But, how many Africans really know the the, symbol, the symbolism of, of the leopard? Do you understand? Or what type of uh, um, culture he is? Now, which also takes us to this good and bad. Now, the better explanation is just like in science, you cannot separate the proton from the neutron or the electron. They have to be together for balance. Now, what we're saying is, and what the African traditions believe in this, is that in every person, in every human being, from the smallest particle in nature, which is the atom, to the beacon, you have a positive and negative. So you cannot, but you see, what that transforms is that God is truly almighty to the African. He is the creator of good and also the creator of fire. But in the conception of Abraham, is to tell you that God is good all the time, and is the Satan who does that. No, you cannot separate good and bad. And what that you can say is that in your own heart, you have good and you have bad, and it is up to you, your free will, to choose what you want to choose. Whether you want to choose the good, but whatever you choose, this is a circle is coming back. Whether it's good or bad. And that's why we have a long way song of Oku and Oku, Igbo and some other uh, tradition. And that's why you, you, you understand is that some action, like you know, we say you know, if if one person will know bad, somebody will know food. If somebody does not lose the job, who is the bad thing, somebody can't get a job. If somebody does it, you, 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 you understand. So every action, every action. It depends on what, from what perspective that we see. Even death is not bad because if people didn't die, then it will be over. You understand? So even death is a circle, is the completion of a circle of life, um, of birth, life, and death. But the European looks at it, you know, from a leaning point of view, is that look, Jesus, um, good is here, bad is here. And that brings to the total misconception of everything in life. You understand that? That's why I said that. We, we understand that. And when you look at it scientifically, there is nowhere in nature the negative and positive, if it's going to be a stable thing, have to be together. You understand? It's like you have an on and off switch. You cannot just have an on button without having an on. But the fact that the on is not negative, but it has, you know, you have to have that balance. And this is the balance that we need, that humanity now needs, you know, to sustain the heart. It's not that, all oh, is bad and, you know, this America, let's go bump them. And, but no, uh, like, you know, what the narrative is, is that, oh, issue is uh, bad. No, it's good and bad. And this is where, and, the, and you see, one of the reasons where 
us not understanding the concept of our um, spiritual essence of um, information. You get me? Is that she always makes it clear that that it depends on your perspective. Is where you, it's from where you stand that can decide whether something is good or bad, whether it's east or west. Is from your perspective. It is not that thing, really. You would say uh, North Africa. North Africa is there because that's south. You understand? You have this side of my hand, which is black, because it has this side. You understand? So, and that duality is trapped. You have one side, you have the other side. Well, it's not that my red side or my right side is the bad side or the good. No, they have to be together for balance. Now, it is this complete understanding of the cosmos of this universe that the African had and which reflected in the religion compared to the European, who is a newcomer, who just sees one side and just says that look, if you put it by violence and you put it by overwhelming force, then that's going to go through. But it, I mean, it's really taking the matter of time for us to realize that. Uh, that concept cannot, uh, it is not sustainable, and that we will destroy this planet if we, um, if we continue with that uh, linearity. First, uh, Father, I, 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 I feel you have um, an advantage um, with with the with the linkages you have already to to certain sectors of society, and 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 I, I wonder why. Or what if there's a problem or an issue that that, that has stopped those people? Like I mean, the only of Ife and people like that. I believe they have a certain influence into getting things like the curriculum, things you're talking about, being inputted into the curriculum, or at least to, to voicing it. I think they have some sway that could be able to push push the agenda a bit a bit forward. Wouldn't you say? Uh, we first of all, you have to realize that the only Ife is only three years on show. And uh, he's the first person to come and outline um, the linkages between Yoruba and Igbo and brought the kings together. And the uh, Ashe Foundation was only registered last year. So, yes, after I wrote my book, and the book came out in, two, I mean, I wrote it in 1999, the book came out in 2006. I came back here in 2009. And, uh, because of uh, the Jonathan and other things, people weren't listening so much. And then again, because if you see the blackboard, you really have to be an academic to read the book. But we really started uh, having much progress when the documentary was made. And um, after I finished writing, the logical things, the, the, you know, what uh, they would call the matter um, about in 2006, I went on to a study of um, the cosmos. If you get me, and that was when you understand which I know 2004. So it was after that. Right now, you know, because I had already spent half of my life on this um, on uh, DNA, you know, the academic part. So. After finishing that, I was like, what, what else can I read? And then I decided to delve into the spiritual, into the cosmos. And now, and now when I now got it, and then now at par, that I now made the documentary. Now, it is a documentary that cuts the leadership. You know, I gave the book to um, Chief Palai in 2009. I gave the book to practically all, all of them. Even the minister of, uh, of, um, Culture when I came because then you know, I, you know, I tried everything. Even to Nimbo, even to Nimbo went to meet him. Um, but you see, yes, the Minister of Culture was so happy when he heard the land, but he had to leave. But the main thing was nobody was going to read that 500 pages. You understand? They had it, they read to Tuba, everybody loved Tuba, the novel, short, but he actually think and assimilate the black world revolution. You have to have a, you have to be at a level of consciousness, if you understand. But when the documentary came out in 2006, that was when it started catching the attention. And I went to Ulufalaya and to that friend, and look, 
you being part of this you want to do yourself it how are we going to push it forward and it's like you know what we are going to have to go to the only of if so in 2017 for me, only in 2017, he was so happy because he also had had that discrimination. He had the spiritual part of it, and he wanted that. He wanted, he wanted, you know, because the young man, he wanted the black. I had already gone to the previous one only of if uh, uh, situation. People just uh, yeah, that's nice, blah blah blah, and they don't know. But this current only of if is young, who knows it? But yes, we must do something about it. Like, okay, what are we going to do first? So, okay, let's call a conference, let's get along with So, we got the conference, we did the conference in 2018. You understand? After the conference, all the kings coming together, it's like, you know what? Instead of just doing the conference and talking, let's have a body together. Let's form, and that's when we formed our share foundation. Now, we start to form that because we had the conference in uh, in our share foundation. I mean, we had the conference on. African origins in February 2018, and we decided to create um, Ashe Foundation in 2018 June. Now, they didn't, uh, the, because of how Nigeria is, it didn't work out until 2000, you know, even though we put in the papers, we didn't get the papers till last year, February. Now, after getting the papers last year, February, we still having problems to get the account because this happens and that happens. So you can see that. Yes, they are, but you know, there are also these things. But at the same time, I realize that things are coming in. I mean, Oni, Oni has done so much within the last three three years, he's come into power. You can see that he's uh, elevated the, uh, the, you know, our fortress. And when I went to meet all the other kings, they was like, yes. Only has said this to us before, before you came along, and you now provide. You because you see, even among them as a class, they realize that when they're in the meetings, that the Afroasians, the Islamic, they get the upper hand. So they, they, you know, naturally is like, look, we need to do something. We are seventy percent of the population, but we are getting less than thirty percent of the. Uh, you understand the power or the or, or the relevance. So they had to be, they wanted to come together, but unfortunately, the Eurocentric uh, scholars still stuck to, you came from uh, Yemen, you came from Jew, you came from which, <laughs> not United. <laughs> what I'm not doing, and I'll tell you, uh, I'll tell you that the first day I um, met the Oni, I was taking by a market down there, and I was like, Kabe said, this is the list of all the DNA. He leaped, he leaped up and was like, yes. You know, that was that happy, that yes. So you, you have the DNA and linguistics to link all of us. Was like, this is what I've been looking for since I've been to the hand. He's, uh, you know, I could see that you know, because he's young and he's exposed and especially a king now on social media, he reads, he understands, he sees the cosmic theories, he sees the real ones, he sees everything. So he's like, yes, this is what, and um, he's not been found wanting. He's, uh, you know, I could see that there's, uh, you, you, I mean, for him to even come out and say that uh, Yoruba and people come from the same place, you don't know how much stick you received from different quarters both from his own side, uh, and both of you are bound from some evils, and but he's with at the storm and he's ready to, you understand, he keeps on pushing it. He realized that his last uh, main festival, the Lodge of Festival, the main uh, star there was the Eze of, of, of Oka. So he knows that, he knows that, but at the same time, you can't do too much too soon. People like me could, but he also has to be very careful because that this will say, oh, he's selling us out to evils. Oh, he's got a contract for money for it. So he's also trying it, but you understand, he can't be, I mean, if you, I mean, otherwise you have what happened to the Shah of Iran. If you push the people too much from the, I mean, I've had uh, some king, you know, comments that, look, I understand what you're saying. 
but my great grandfather, my great my great great grandfather, everybody says we come from uh, Yemen. But from this evidence, I can see we didn't come from there. But it's difficult for me to go and meet the other eight, 80 year olds and tell them, oh, I've changed my mind. So I know what you're doing, but you know, drag the, the cultural institution slowly. Otherwise, it will lose, it will become too revolutionary for them. So there's a balance. I hear you. Uh, th 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 thanks for even uh, addressing the consideration. Anyway, but um, I, I, I know I know you're you're moving in the right direction, and um, hopefully in time they'll, they'll come around to it. And I'm sure you'll continue um, doing what you're doing. And I applaud you for what you're doing. And um, I really want to thank you for coming on the show and giving us your time. Uh, it's been very enlightening, uh, very interesting. I urge everyone watching to, uh, as I posted, to go look at his, um, his, uh, his YouTube page, his AU Media, and the book, uh, The Black World, Evolution to Revolution, it's out in stores. Uh, do you have any projects that are coming out anytime soon that you'd like people to know about? Well, we, you see now, we did, because we have The Black World, we have a tutorial about which covers slavery, our history of slavery. And when the, the, the last book was um, The Skills of the Vex Child, which is a novel, because you see, when you can visualize things, you can actualize things. And one of the greatest fears is that, oh, you can never take up America. You can never pay the women. So I had to write that novel to say, okay, listen, even if we decide to take them on, and if they won't, no matter what, how are we going to win? If we, if we suddenly find ourselves in the war, how are we going to win? And you know, I have to break it down and make people realize that look, they're not, nobody is invincible. If you just get yourself together, if you, if you unite, then you realize that you can then, um, you can do it. So we have that book, but apart from those huge books and um, the documentary, what we now need to do is to, um, get things out in small, small group. You understand? Uh, 20 minutes, you know, three minutes, five minutes videos, you know, uh, either from serious point of view or was jokes, or you have to keep on producing material to engage the people, but not as a whole, you understand, not the whole evolution to revolution, but where they are, because you see, 90% of the people who, read, I mean, who call themselves Christians and Muslims, they don't even know the death. We just know about the cross. They know the day they're going for Christmas, the day they're going for, for Easter. Every and now. that's just it. Mm -hmm. So you cannot get, you know, all what we've been talking about or in the black world, you cannot expect to get it to all parts of, you know, of the masses. You have to use the symbolism. You have to use some things that they can just grab on. You understand? And as, I mean, you know, you know, the written Amoteco, for example, shows you how, without saying a word, how you can mobilize so much people because, it, you know, it, you know, it, it resonates with their, you know, their cultural DNA. Not only Yorubas, but even the Igbo and other people, you know, was like, and that's the kind of thing that we have to design where you don't have to put too much theory into it, but the symbolism, the, the, the little bits, the, the, you understand, the information that you get is that you, you have to play or you have to work as hard as the European needs to get our mind. Because, you see, it wasn't about uh, the, the theological uh, and practicalities of, of Roman Catholicism that attracted Africans. It was the fine leads, uh, nice, you know, the, the imagery of Christianity, the new that really won the souls. And that is what we really need to do for our own um, cultures that they're thinking about that. You understand? And that was what, because um, Professor uh, Sylvia Oluwale, you know, um, she was the one that made me do the documentary. I just sat down one day, I was a bit uh, getting distribution, and I saw that she did a video that was three seconds. And before I knew anything, uh, in about 45 minutes, it attracted about 3,000 views. And I was like, hold on, 
So when I went to meet, and this is an 80 year old woman, I was like, Mama, after all your 40 books you are doing with your mama said, Look, I've written 40 books down there, but these kids are no longer reading. It is our work to um, contact them, to get to them in the format that they are using. You don't just say, oh, I've written the book, or no. Whatever format that the masses, the youth are using, is through that format that you have. If the youth cannot, if they don't have an attention span of more than three, uh, uh, three, minutes, three minutes, then you have to break it into those three, three minute videos and get it to them. So it is, and it makes the teacher actually better because you have to refine what you say to the minimum and to get it across to them. But you're not going to just say that, oh, I've written the book, why should you go and read the book? No, that's not the way we, you know, we have to get our people uh, back. You have to use whatever, if it is, if it is a Snapchat or whatever they call it, that you're going to use to pass that information, you have to pass that information. Yeah, get it. I and agree, that's what Foundation has to be just have to be creative because they were creative to get all these things these crosses and you know all that the music i mean when you see because i grew up you know with that catholic but by the time i was in my third i was like and i now realized the petty costa and i used to wonder what is attracting these people to petty costa but the day I went to that church and I heard that music, I was like, no wonder. You understand when you hear it? So they, you understand, they, and, and, and the annoying thing is that they are using our culture, what we like in our culture, to oh, yeah. take them to their culture. So we have this thing, we have this flash, we have this music, we have this, the jokes and things like that. We have a, what we need is to use them, you understand, to attract our own people. Don't just try and be boring and times of long speeches and long work. That's not going to work today. That's what our Chef Foundation has to do. That's the work in front of us, is that get to the people, get that through the stars, they're not, I mean, we, I mean, if you look at our plans on our Chef Foundation, we do concerts, we do small clips with comedians and co just to pass the message of course. Mm. And that's that's just the job we have to do. No, I share, share a lot of sentiments and and those views as well. I do really appreciate it. Um so just one, one, one final final question before we go. Um so this this conglomerate of uh of city states and, and, and different um uh, nations coming together, do you have any do you have a name in, in your mind? Do you have a concept that you can put them all under? Do you have an umbrella name or entity that you would call it? Just, just, just it's curious. No, I really don't. Uh, I don't. I, 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 you see one thing again. I don't believe. You see, I believe in so many things evolving naturally. Like for one, I, I'm against uh, a single language. I'm, a, I'm against a single language. I believe that um, when we have the uh, continent-wide uh, thing, I believe that a single language will evolve. Let that language evolve itself. Not, now, not from that language, you know, that language eventually we get our real name. Well, you see, you call it Africa, some people will say Africanos. You call it Akebulan, they will say it's Arabic. You call it this one, you know, it's just, you know, Let's just, uh, let's get that thing together. And um, if we're going to have to call it original Africans or we're going to call it, it's not, you understand, it's something that I believe that will develop over years. But the point is to get everybody together. I agree that, look, let every group have it, have control over its own culture, politics, and economy. No matter how small, let each one of them have and then, um, you know, in that continent wide, I don't even believe that we should um, cut off Afro-Asian. I just believe that, look, if we have our own strong platform, then we can deal with them. You understand? They will have to change. Well, you know, they are, they are the minority in Nigeria and across Africa, they're only 30%. But the only, the only reason why they are getting 
uh, I mean, letting away with mother is that they cut off one thirty percent from the sixty percent of us added to theirs, and then you see that divide and rule. But if there's no divide and rule, even within an African region, I mean, original Africans will do well. But if they now say, look, no, we cannot take it, then they're free to go. You understand? But well, the African Union, the African, the continent wide uh, self determined states will be along our own uh, collective um, aspirations, which you find that all Niger Congo groups, that's how they feel. It's only the Afroasians who believe that they have to dominate because in the first place they don't have much of land. But every original African group has its own land and is ready to, you understand? So, but I don't have a name yet. We can call it Azania, we can call it Biafra, we can call it Tudua. The name is, uh, you know, eventually when we now have evolved the language. Yes, uh, well, we, even actually, I uh, believe that maybe within 10 years, we will have the name. We, uh, you understand? Or, like, as done in history, the ancestors will give us a name. <laughs> you understand? Hmm. They will give, you know, because in most cases, you realize that in ancestors, you see, you will call you what, you know, it could be a joking name or something, but. Is you know it's not that it, uh, when it comes to that name, there must be a word name because I mean, like for example, I see that the word Ngozi is uh, is um, popular in Igbo land all the way down to uh, South Africa. I've met a Botswana lady whose name was called Morowa, which means the same thing in Yoruba. So when you when we put those. And there is an Olomide in Congo. Olomide. So when we put the when we put the O, M, B, M together, when we sit down, we realize that there are some. I mean, if nobody knows that Yoruba and Igbo share over a hundred words. So when we actually get down to the table and call, I can tell you that we will find a, a name that will mean. Will have a meaning majority. For example, ba means the same thing. And baba, we could call ourselves baba as far as I'm concerned, because it's the you understand or mama or you understand, but the name is not is not what I've uh, because I know that it's still um it's still way ahead. And that's just uh that's just a tag. It's what we are really doing. I mean we already had a, Organization of African Unity in the African Africa, then we have uh, African Union in South Africa because that's the where they we you have the largest white population in in, um, in Africa. So eventually, when we get, we we will find a name. We will. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. I know it's a bit late. <laughs> We could still talk talk for hours, um, because um, you know this this topic is yes, uh, know, yeah. expanded. Yes, but uh, we really do appreciate you coming on, and uh, I urge everyone watching uh, to please go uh, check out the page, uh, go check out his books, his prints, um, prints. Uh, yes. Sorry, I was just I actually. So go on, uh, Prince Justice. By the way, sorry, go on. Oh, it's gone off. Oh no. Oh no. Uh, that's unfortunate. Okay. Well. Uh, Th thank you all for watching. Um, thanks for your comments, and uh, hope you enjoyed the show. Um, please leave your questions, comments, and do check out his name. He's a French justice following author of the Black World Evolution to Revolution. Oh, he's, he's back on. Uh, when you came back on before, I was just closing. I was just telling people to check out your your book and uh, and the other book you have, and also your page. And we really do appreciate you coming on board. Uh, it's been a very interesting conversation. Appreciate your time. Thanks a lot for having me. And yes, uh, I hope we can um, speak another time. Yeah, I hope I've, uh, yes. I hope I've, I've uh, shed enough light, or at least enough light, on most of the questions you asked. Yeah, definitely.
Yes, you did. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. So thank you and, and stay safe in this time of lockdown. And hope we'll, we'll speak to you again soon. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks.